there, there were two things I was seriously considering, and then one thing that I'm I'm, I'm going to do someday. So seasteading is off the table right now; it's too long term. But there were two short term things that I was looking at uh, aside from Anderl. So the three choices were fix national security, solve obesity, or solve incarceration. Uh, and the, the, you know, I, I tried to think about, you know, what are the ways that I would tackle these issues? And the way I solved defense was I wanted to build a defense products company that upends the incentives that typically exist in the military industrial complex. But the, the prison one was that I wanted to basically take out the incentives of the private prison complex that exists today. Right now, private prison companies are are growing. There's more and more people being housed in privately operated prisons. They're publicly traded. And those companies have a strong incentive to lobby for and, and perpetuate laws that incarcerate people for the longest period of time for the least serious crime. In other words, they don't want murderers and terrorists. They want they want nonviolent drug offenders who will be in prison for a long time. And when they get out of prison, they want them to come back and be a repeat customer. Right. They want good, good tenants. They want good yeah. right. high occupancy, good yeah. tenants. <laughs> and, and the incentives they've set up with the government where the government prepays for these beds. The government basically says, well, we've already paid for the bed. So if they're not full, then we're not locking up enough people. It, it's, a, it's a very bad set of incentives. So my idea was that I could start a private prison company that would run as a nonprofit organization. And we would use the tax advantages of that to outcompete private prison companies. And more importantly, we would have a business model that would incent everybody towards the right set of incentives. So what I wanted to do was go to the government and say, listen, I'll lock up your prisoners, uh, but you don't get to pay us up front. In fact, you can't pay us up front. You have to pay us after the person serves their term and then stays out of prison for five years. Then you're going to pay me. Uh, and the idea is that now all of a sudden I'm motivated and ev you know, my, my whole organization is motivated to get people through as quickly as possible, release them as quickly as possible, and then have them stay out of prison and not return to crime. And that, I mean, that would have been that would have been a game changer and it would have been a very attractive business model to these governments that are always you know, looking to delay their expenditures. The, the biggest problem that I ran into as I looked into this is it wasn't a technological problem. It was a lobbying and marketing and government affairs problem. And it wasn't at a federal level where you can basically convince a handful of people and then achieve success. It, it was going to be this like this lo locale by locale thing where you have a lot of people who depend on prisons for jobs. You have a lot of politicians who are very involved in it. It was and also the deals are not recompeted very often. This isn't like enterprise software where people are always on the lookout for a way to get an edge or move to a new provider that could reduce their costs or risk. It's like, oh, yeah, we're, we're going to recompete this deal in 35 years. And so it's, it, it would have been this thing where I, I just couldn't have made an impact fast enough. And so I've been involved with other people who are making impacts in other ways. Okay, so that was you, one. You, well, you couldn't just have like some Silicon Valley guy wearing like tight jeans and brown shoes like every other salesperson sitting down like, no. hey, so we'd like to have a conversation about your prisoners. We'd like to have your business. Like, you know, no, no, it, 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 give me some of your guys. Unfortunately not. Uh, yeah, yeah, unfortunately not. And, and the thing is the people who make the decisions uh, would not have benefited from us succeeding. So in, in business, look, when you're, and this is a big, we can get into this with Anderl too. One of the biggest problems with selling to the government versus uh, businesses or private private individuals with 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 private individuals and businesses, you just have to convince them that uh, it'll be that it'll be a you know that, that it'll be a good thing for them, and then they'll buy them. The people who are in charge of purchasing for government, they often don't benefit from saving money or reducing their manpower or any of this. Like in many cases, the guy in charge of making the buying decision, his political power and earning power are directly tied to his ability to keep costs high and to keep manpower up and to not allow anything to displace that. So that was actually the big problem. I realized that you know, it's, it's nice to think you can solve any problem uh, with, with new ideas through disruption, but some things are kind of self-reinforcing, very hard to fix. The, the other thing I was looking at is obesity. You know, obesity is, uh, is one of, if not the leading preventable cause of death in the United States. Uh, either there's so many, there's so many other health problems that are the result of, of obesity. And uh, some people say that we need to make exercise more popular. Some people say that we need to stop normalizing obesity. Some people say we need medical treatment for it, or we, you know, we need to make eat healthy eating better. I, I took a pretty cynical view of it. I said, no, obesity is not going away unless you let American people 
eat whatever they want, whenever they want, as much as they want, with no lifestyle changes, no exercise, and absolutely no effort on their parts whatsoever. And so within that constraint, what could you do to, to solve this issue? And uh, the, 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 the result, the, the, the idea I came on was uh, long chain hydrocarbon based synthetic foods. So in other words, oil based foods. Uh, you, you guys are familiar with Impossible Burger, Beyond Burger. Have you had them? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it was probably better than the worst beef burger you've ever had, right? It was, it was at least at that level. It's, wor it's better than the worst one you've ever had. Yeah, it, it was a whatever. I'll eat this. Yeah, whatever you'll eat this, but certainly not up to the level of the best beef burger you've ever had. Um, no. And, and so one of the one of the interesting, this is where I was drawing from outside, you know, in an outside world, all these people trying to make fake food, they're all trying to build fake food out of food. And I said, well, wait, let's think of this from first principles. If I'm a materials engineer and I'm trying to solve the set of problems that a fake burger manufacturer is trying to solve, you know, how it feels in your mouth, how it comes apart in your mouth, how it, how it sears, how it cooks, how it changes texture when it's cooked. If I was a chemical or material engineer trying to build, let's say it's not food, just a, you know, a, a paste, a substance with a certain set of, of parameters, what am I going to use? Is it, is it beans? Is it chickpeas? Is it corn? No, of course not. I'm going to use oil because man is a master of oil. We can make it in anything, waxes, gels, solids, anything in between, rubbers, pastes. We can do anything with oil. We can make it into truly anything with almost any material properties that we want. And so I said, well, let's leverage that. Let's leverage everything we know about making inert hydrocarbons that are non-toxic and use that to make fake food for people that tastes and feels like real food, but has zero caloric value that cannot be absorbed by your body. It just goes right through you, just like fiber. And the thing just is, like it's a, not that crazy. A, Taco Bell. A Diet Coke for, a, a, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, it's a, <laughs> yeah, that exists, dude. It's called White Castle. Uh, but you're, I mean, yeah, you're just saying like the Diet Coke cheeseburger. Yes, a Diet, a Diet Coke cheeseburger, the Diet Coke cheese, the Diet, you know, the, the, the Diet Coke dairy products. And so I actually started making prototypes of this and I was messing around with a, a frying foods and mineral oil uh, with, with, with high flash points because mineral oil, also no calories. Uh, I made some paraffin based cheese. Uh, so it was basically like paraffin wax based fake cheese product that you could still make grilled cheese sandwiches with. And it tasted great, but at almost no calories. Um, it was, it, there were a few other wild things that came with. I, I also built a device that injected uh soda syrup through a stream onto your tongue directly as carbonated water flowed over it because it turns out you can only detect it's a weird perceptual thing people think of uh, optical illusions as as you know the the main type of illusion that's out there but there's also physical illusions like if you if you put pudding, pudding in your mouth your body assumes that the full mass of the pudding is comprised of whatever is touching your tongue but if you can create uh, physically structured foods where the part that's touching your tongue is different than the bulk of the rest of the material, your body still thinks that the entire bulk of it is whatever's touching your tongue. Anyway, dude, what I, I what, went what down this rabbit hole it, for a while. What does your house look like? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it, it, it's, it's a little more boring now. Um, but at the time, uh, when, when I was acquired by Facebook, I moved up to the Bay Area and we had about 10 people living in a 13,000 square foot home that was built in the thirties on six acres. And so we turned the dining room into a machine shop. We turned, uh, we, we turned the, there, there was like a, like a ballroom for dancing. And we turned that into an assembly area and, and, and welding, welding room. I mean, we, we had a soft goods as, room in, in, as in one a little does. sunny area <laughs> as someone does. It was, it was really, it was, it was really cool. I don't even know what that means. What are soft goods? <laughs> oh, so it's like, um, so like, like uh, cream cheese. Like, <laughs> I mean, like the, the traditional example when people talk like a soft goods engineer would be like uh, like tennis shoes, bras, um, uh, you know, th things that are incorporating fabrics and also apply or think, you know, like a like a, a tennis, a tennis racket is 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 an example of soft good engineering where you've got, you know, the handle and the shock absorption and all that. But like in our case, it was for head mounted display stuff. Um, so like head mounted display straps, the fat, the fabric associated with it. Um, we also were, you know, we're, we're also cosplayers. So we were also building our, building our anime costumes there. So a lot of soft, so good stuff. You, 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 the more you talk, the more I realize you, uh, you do the one thing that we celebrate the most on this podcast. Cause they're like, people are like, oh, I don't get it. Like you and Sam, you do a certain style of entrepreneurship, right? 
I like, yep. for example, I optimize for just, I want it to be me and one other dude. I don't want any employees. I don't want to go to an office and I just want max yep, leverage. Yep. And I'm not trying to be a billionaire. I don't want to raise money. I want to own the whole thing and just do it my way on whatever projects are fun. Yep. And, um, but then sometimes we'll celebrate like the you and Elon Musk of the world that are going huge. And sometimes we celebrate this dude who's making this Chrome extension. And he makes 20 K a month and lives in you know Bali and he's having fun. And so people don't yep. get it. They're like, what do you res- like? Which one do you admire? Like, I get it. TechCrunch admires this thing and VCs yep. admire this thing, but you guys seem to be across the board. And we're like, we like people that just define the win, define winning on their terms and then like actualize it. So like you having a house with 13 other people that does, that has like, you know, an assembly room and a soft goods room and whatever. It seems like you're living your best life in that state. Maybe a hundred percent. And, well, and, and I mean, it's, 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 it's the, the weird thing about what I get to do now. Like you know, these, these all sound, you know, like, like, like fun things, but I'm still getting to do that. And like Andrew, we have all kinds of stuff like that going on. Actually, the, 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 the tough thing is the coolest things that we're doing here. I can't even necessarily talk about because the, the most successful projects that are doing the cool, going in the coolest directions are the ones that, that, that we have to keep kind of uh, on wraps. Oh, I have to say on, on petroleum food, just in case anyone's wondering why I didn't do that. Um, one, I thought national security would, would be a better use of my time. And that was because I realized uh, tech was that national security was a technological problem in addition to being a lobbying and marketing problem and sales problem. Um, the, the problem with petroleum foods is that it was not sustainable if using new oil as a feedstock, um, it would just, it would consume too much. Uh, and the good news is you can recycle hydrocarbons, but then, I mean, if you, I don't know if you can see where this is going, but it means you're going to literally be like centrifuging oil out of the sewer system and then reusing it to construct new food. And I realized, like, have you have you seen all the you know media coverage yeah. of pink pink slime at McDonald's? And that's just like I, I, that's just I saw chicken, it but way. it looks kind of gross. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm at, I'm at, do you think people want to buy food that's literally remanufactured from sewage? You know that 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 was kind of the main problem. I said, you know what, I'm 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 pretty good at marketing and sales. I am not good enough to sell sewer food to people. Yeah, you you, you sound. I'm gonna, like... I need to figure that out. You sound like you're a bad guy in Batman. If you're like, yeah, he's going through the sewers and recycling it, turning it into food well, for the it's city. Too, it's, it, <laughs> it's like, it, it's almost too good of a story, right? Like, like I, I under, sometimes I think the media is unfair, but it's like, how, could you expect them to not, you know, sensationalize literally a guy who's, who's selling reprocessed sewage as food. Like, it, it's like they have to cover it in a sensational way and I can't even blame them for it. And I decide I would rather work in an area where technological improvement would be the main way that you would compete. We didn't need to you know, do crazy marketing. You just had to be competent and be better than all of the other players, which was not necessarily that high of a bar.